So uh, thank you everybody for showing up for my talk. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the the, um, the invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that's a relatively new field for me. Um, uh, I normally do uh, stochastic dynamics and nonlinear dynamics and a lot of uh, theoretical neuroscience, uh, but I've always kept an interest in uh, time series analysis and uh, in particular physiological dynamics. Uh, and uh, this is maybe a particularly timely uh, vent, uh, venture into um, what happens to humans under heat stress and exercise, given the global climate issues that we're all dealing with. So um, these are the co-workers. So uh, Nicolas Brader is the PhD candidate uh, who's been uh, whose work I'm going to be talking about. And uh, Sean Notley was a postdoc of Glenn Kettle, uh, Kenny here. Uh, Glenn is uh, one of the experts, world experts on uh, whole body calorimetry, putting humans inside a calorimeter and uh, basically monitoring a whole bunch of physiological functions while they're doing that. And um, so we're using his data from his lab, collaborating with him. And the last one here is Andrew Seeley, who's a, he's a thoracic surgeon here at the Ottawa Hospital. Um, he has an undergraduate degree in physics, and uh, we actually collaborate for the last 10 years on a bunch of topics related to complexity in physiology and medicine. So this is uh, this is where this project kind of sits, uh, uh, human-wise. And uh, so the gen I'm going to try and frame the general context here. It's about, of course, how living systems self-organize, as we just saw in the, in the previous talk in a fascinating way. Um, and, uh, so we have, um, you know, we, we, we are basically able to get a bunch of molecules in a box to turn into a human being. And, uh, how does that happen? Uh, it's because there's, we're, we're not closed systems. We are, uh, driven by uh, various energy flows and, and exploit energy gradients in our environment in order to do so. So the living systems, they achieve highly ordered configurations through the exchange of energy and matter with their environment. But uh, every time energy is transformed from one form to another, part of it becomes less useful because typically it will get lost in heat and increase the entropy of the universe. And the, the entropy of the universe will go up by factors delta Q over, over the temperature. So the heat, the change in heat flow uh, divided by the temperature. So uh, there's uh, been a lot of work over many years trying to figure out how the human body regulates heat flow and uh, modeling the body as a multi-compartmental system and so on. But uh, given the interest in uh, self-organizing systems uh, far from equilibrium and the relationship to principles of maximal or minimal entropy production, we wanted to see if we can tie in those results from heat flow measurements to uh, to the concepts of entropy and how would one do that? This is basically what this talk is about. And um, so the paper just came out in entropy about a, about a month ago, if you want to see more detail. So we're gonna pay attention to the entropy balance in the body. So the rate of entropy change of a system, in our case, the system is going to be the body, it's given by two terms. So there's gonna be a first term. Uh, I don't know if anybody can see my cursor here. Can, can you see yeah, the cursor? Maybe we can, yes. Okay, so the entropy change of the body is gonna be, so this is not the universe, it's just the body. So this is an internal, generated typically ir through irreversible processes you'll get a change in entropy but uh, but this will be counteracted by the dissipation or flow of entropy out to the environment so this is the second term here the s towards the environment so we have an internal entropy production which typically is positive and we'll have an external entropy dissipation or flow uh, that will be typically non-zero unless the system is adiabatic, in which case it can't, the heat can't escape. But for our body, it escapes in various ways as we're gonna discuss right now. So the objectives is to measure the entropy production and dissipation rate in humans during 
Now you can do this, you know, at rest. You can do it while you're firefighting. You can do it, you know, while you're you're sitting in a in a boiling weather in Barcelona or whatever. There's there's a lot of context you can do this in. So what we're going to look at is you know baseline rest and then going into exercise. And the exercise is not really in a pleasant environment. It's going to be like at 35 degrees. So there's going to be some heat stress. And we're going to investigate numerically and some theoretical ideas how entropy is regulated by the human body, uh, which is basically what we're we're trying to get at is that is there such a thing as entropy regulation in the body? So we are looking at this from the point of view of uh, physiology so it's like a two compartment model you can think of the body as being constituted of a core and of the skin which is the interface with the with the environment now in our experiments in glenn's experiments the body's in a calorimeter and uh so we're going to have some generation of heat internally and there's going to be some heat going out into the environment. So you can imagine the body is like, a, has a core at a temperature T core and the skin at a temperature TS. And there's gonna be a flux of heat typically this way, but it could go the other way as well. And this is then gonna be in contact with the heat bath, Q out. So you can split up the entropy of the body into two pieces. It's like the core part and the skin part. So this is a, in, in, the, in the framework developed by Prigogine and others, you can split up the entropy of a system into the sum of the entropies of the subsystems, entropy being an extensive quantity. And then uh, you take the rate of change of all this. So then you just sum up the rates of change. Now, uh, if you want to model this in a bit more detail, you, you have this entropy change for the body is gonna be the internal entropy production divided by the temperature of the core. And that on the other side, you'll have Q out divided by the temperature of the skin. And then there'll be a heat flow from one place to the other, let's say from core to skin. And, uh, but will, will lead to an increase in entropy uh, at the skin, but a loss of entropy for the core. But as I said, this could also change sign depending on the relative um, magnitudes of the core and skin temperatures. Now it turns out that this term, so we're going to make things as simple as possible because what, one can go on endlessly modeling this thing in, in, in many details. Uh, but there's a lot of, there's some holes. You know, we don't have control on everything going on in the body from an entropic point of view. So uh, it turns out this, this term is about like worth about 1%. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to leave it out. And we're going to basically say that there's two components to what changes the entropy of the body. There's going to be the rate at which you generate heat internally from your metabolic processes, basically, and how you get the heat out from the skin. So it's a production term and a dissipation term. Okay, so now we have this equation for the entropy production in the body. We just need to figure out how to measure the variables. And that's, that's what uh, we're going to talk about now. So there's this thing called a Snellen calorimeter. It's been around for a couple of decades, but it's been uh, improved in various ways. And Glenn Kenny is one of the people who has the state-of-the-art machine here. I'll give you an idea what it looks like. I'll just go ahead here for a second. This is what it looks like. So there's a person in there and um, and we're monitoring or Glenn is monitoring the all the gases, all the gas exchange. And uh, the body temperature uh, through various probes, there's four probes on the skin. Uh, depending on what kind of experiment is doing, usually there'll be a, a rectal probe as well to get a closer access to the core temperature uh, or an esoph esophageal probe. And, um, and then this whole thing has reflective boundaries, as you see, and that's because they, the, the radiation of the heat out of the body gets kind of reflected back to the body. That's not a big deal. It's, it's again, in the few percentage range. Uh, but they try to calibrate the thing as best as possible using these various um, uh, techniques, such as you know, reflective uh, materials on the walls. Now, the subject is sitting and is also pedaling on a bike, a stationary bike, an ergometer, and uh, they can adjust the work rate of the subject by figuring out, by, by adjusting basically the friction on the ergometer. So they can 
to set out the work rate. And through the gas exchange, they can figure out also uh, how much energy is being consumed by the body. So if we go back here, we'll go into detail about these things. So inside we have the gas exchange and then to this mixing box, they can figure out the ratio of O2 and CO2 and that'll be a measure of internal energy production. I'm gonna skip some of the details here for the sake of time. And that's called uh, indirect calorimeter because we don't really have the, the, the temperature you know, all over the body. It turns out the body is quite an inhomogeneous place. You know, we can we store heat and muscles and fat in our brain in all kinds of ways. So we're talking about averages here. And the indirect calorimeter, uh, by looking at the heat flows, is actually able to give you um, the most, what we think, or what Glenn thinks, is the most accurate measurement of your core temperature. And through direct calorimeter, through the direct calorimetry here with the air flow and analyzing the, the air coming out, you can measure the temperature of the air coming out, the, the humidity of the air coming out, and you can look at the changes in the humidity and the changes in the temperature. And then this is pumped back in uh, with a whole bunch of controls and mixings and so on. So uh, basically this part for the internal calorimetry, you can look at uh, VO2, uh, those of you who train, you know, know about VO2 max, know how, you know, when you train at a certain level of your maximum, uh, it's a measure of health, uh, how, how big your VO2 max is. Uh, but here is the, it's going to be the respiratory energy ratio, exchange ratio um, that can be measured. And we can get the energy liberated through uh, aerob aer aerobic metabolism and we can account for the work done. So basically we're talking about the first law, which a bit looks like this, which is the internal uh, energy heat production is gonna be the metabolic energy minus the work rate. Uh, all these are powers, they're all time derivatives. And um, the second part, the direct calorimetry measurements is gonna give you the dry heat loss. So that's gonna be through um, things like radiation and uh, conduction of heat away from your body through the air, as well as convection. Uh, because you are moving around, there's a bit of air moving around in, inside, so it'll be some convective component. Uh, but the dominant part is this evaporative heat loss, which is sweating. So the sweating is going to take out the heat from your body because you're evaporating water, and you're uh, using, uh, so with the, the latent heat for the evaporation, uh, that's gonna be sucking the, the heat out of your body. Okay, so uh, the core temperature, it turns out, can be best estimated, not through uh, a rectal probe or a esophageal probe, but through just looking at Q in this internal energy production, because there's gonna be a heat balance inside the body. There's whatever you, you generate internally from heat, uh, whatever heat you in generate internally and whatever heat you put out, there's going to be a remaining quantity, this balance. And then this, this stored heat, uh, you can write down just an equation for how that's going to change the temperature through some average specific heat for the body. And it turns out this gives you uh, um, quite a, an accurate measurement albeit indirect, but it's actually better than, uh, because it's looking at the whole body's use of, of energy and, and heat management, and you're able to derive a temperature, a core temperature from that. I'll show you a comparison of doing it this way versus uh, thermometry in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so then you can look at how the temperature varies over time. And the skin temperature, well, you put four probes on the skin, basically, and take the average. So the, uh, the heat measurements were recorded in Glenn's lab in his uh, Human and Environmental Physiology Research Unit at the University of Ottawa. And uh, the participants performed an alternate schedule of exercise and recovery period. So they, they get into the machine, they acclimatize to it, which is not an easy task because it's kind of hot in there. And, uh, and then they start doing 15 minute on exercise and then 15 minute off on, off, on, off, four, four periods like that. Um, what you can keep fixed during these experiments is the metabolic heat production. 
and um, because you can um, you can check the gases and you know how much heat is being produced in there and then you can also adjust the work level in order to maintain the whole heat production at about 400 watts. So you have these two measurements, therefore, for the increase in entropy, the internal entropy is going to go up according to this equation with a core temperature and the export of the entropy is going to go along, along Q out, how much heat you're able to throw out, uh, divided by Ts. And there's also some heat released in the gases themselves, and that's taken into account. It's not a big component. So you can look and say at the resting entropy production, and we, it's divided by uh, body surface area. So in our study, this is um, what you would get. And there's a study um, a number of years ago by Aoki, one of the experts in, in this field of looking at complexity and, and health and entropy. Uh, who's inspired a lot of our work. And uh, so we're getting a value quite similar to his, but a higher value of the rest of the entropy production per unit body mass. We're getting 4.3 instead of 3.47. Now, this is the data that we're dealing with. So uh, you can see in the top plot the, uh, the entropy rates. So let me just move this out of the way here. Okay, so in blue, you see the uh, rate of entropy production, the internal entropy production. So there's a resting period, and then the person, the subject starts to exercise. And there's a, so there's heat generated inside the body. And that's measured, as I just pointed out, that's measured through this quantity over here, Q int, which you can measure through this indirect calorimetry. Okay, um, and um, so it, it relies on uh, analyzing the gases basically coming out. And then there's the export of uh, entropy. This is the red curve here. So you see there's a lag for that one. It's related actually to the increase in the body temperature going on. And uh, when the subject starts, uh, sorry, when the subject stops exercising, then this starts going down again. And then there's a rest period and then it'll start going up again and down, up and down, up and down. So the idea is that you're, you're, you're increasing your entropy internally while you're doing the exercise. So the system is not really in a steady state. It's a, it's acclimatizing and almost, I would say, in a steady state before things start. But then after and, and also um, after we go back to some steady state, but during the experiment, it's, things are quite dynamical. So it's, it's, it's kind of non-equilibrium thermodynamics, but on a slow time scale. So the, the temperature is changing slowly. So we can still make some calculations assuming quasi-static approximations, but the temperature is is slowly building up. And uh, if you weren't able to manage that heat and export that heat and export that entropy, you would uh, you would overheat and, uh, and go into some kind of heat shock. Now, um, if you look at the, the, the rate of entropy change, then you start, you see curves like this. So this is the total entropy of the body. Okay. And uh, it may not be completely obvious from this plot, but you know zero is here. So what you can do is you can integrate this and you'll get the integral of ds dt over time. And you're gonna get a, now an idea of how much entropy was actually uh, accumulating in your body. So what you see is that there's an entropy accumulation during the body in, in the, in the, during the experiment. There's actually some buildup already at the beginning because you know, you're, it's, it's a hot environment. And so these are the kinds of curves that are we're interested in. And you know, what is your signature healthy looking uh, entropy accumulation curve for this experiment? And uh, this is done with healthy subjects. It's also done with subjects of different ages. It's also done with subjects of different fitnesses and also 
various pathologies. I'll just show you an example of that in a second. I wanted to point out to you, uh, as promised, um, what happens if you use the thermometry, like thermometers on the body to get the core temperature instead of instead of this indirect way using the, the, the gases and, and the heat flows. And this is what you get, basically. If you were to compute the entropy changes using thermometry, you, know, you, you think you'd be doing a better job with thermometers on the skin and, and a rectal probe. But um, but it actually turns out the calorimetry gives you much more uh, much cleaner signals. So that's a comparison here between the two: thermometry at the top and indirect through calorimetry at the bottom. All right. So um, if you do this, uh, let's say if you compare this across age um, with different uh, you know cohorts, different age groups, and uh, again there's a it's warm in the room, there's heat stress, 35 degrees, 15% relative humidity, but you can compare young, middle age and old. And uh, these are the kinds of curves you get for the, uh, for the entropy, uh, the internal entropy production. You get curves that you, know, you seem to, so if you're young, you seem to be able to reach higher values of entropy production. And that is kind of a, uh, something we'll be able to, to, to generalize that the younger, the healthier you are, you're able to, to create entropy a lot and you're gonna be able to export it, to, to dissipate it a lot. And in the literature, this ability has been associated with you know, better fitness, uh, better adaptability. You're basically, um, oh, let, let's get to that in a second. Let's look at DSEDT. So the entropy dissipation rate you see is also higher for the young cohort. So the rate of entropy change looks like this. And um, so overall, the, the, young, the, 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 the younger cohort is able to get to, uh, so the average rate of entropy change is, um, let me just get this out of the way here, uh, at the end of exercise period is significantly smaller in, 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 young, uh, in young participants. And uh, so the young participants show a greater ability to dissipate the, the entropy. And we can actually look at this at the bottom here, the bottom part. And you can look at young is blue, middle age and old. And um, so um, you'll see some changes here across. This is like, for, this is a rest. And then these are the, for exercise bouts. Okay, so there's significant different differences uh, in the average rates of entropy change at the end of the exercise bouts. Since in the last three minutes of the exercise, you get elevated rates of entropy change um, that derive from the inability to increase entropy dissipation rates. So, so your 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 entropy is increasing too much when you're older, basically, because you're not able to increase your dissipation as well. Now, you would know perhaps in, in, in uh, like your vasculature changes, your sweating ability changes on your skin. Uh, so this gets more impaired as you get older and you are, so you can explain some of these effects through uh, loss of ability to, to sweat. And, uh, Okay, so let me just, so the impairment of entropy dissipation seems to be associated with age. Um, you can look, and this is the cumulative entropy change across age. So you'll see for the young, it's not as bad as it is for the, uh, for the older cohorts. So middle age and older participants have a greater cumulative entropy change compared to the young. Okay. Uh, you can do this also with type 2 diabetes. Uh, you get similar kinds of situation where the controls are doing better than the, uh, than the, uh, the diabetic subjects. Okay, so let me um, just summarize here. The, now, there's a limitation. The temperature is not uniform within the body. And this is still fairly coarse measurements of you no know, entropy changes in the body. We're not monitoring all the chemical reactions, of course. We're getting some kind of global 
um, average effective changes, but it's worth digging into more detail about that, what is actually going on. So the summary of the experimental results is that the, ex the entropy production is a necessary condition for self-organization. This is a, a thought to be the case generally. So you have to be able to basically muster your, your resources and, and, and go through those chemical reactions and so on and, and increase your entropy. And you'll be able to derive some work from that. And you'll be able to also self-organize from that uh, creation of entropy. But you also have to be able to dissipate some of it. So the entropy dissipation is required to prevent entropy accumulation within the body. So the entropy production and dissipation were monitored continuously for the first time using this, this calorimetry experiment. And uh, we find that the uh, <clears throat> that the entropy dissipation is impaired in association with age and fitness and illness, even though I didn't show you those results in any detail. I just want to give you an idea of the, the scope of the, the project, uh, how uh, what, what are the ideas to try and bring idea, idea uh, bring concepts of entropy into classical calorimetric uh, um, research on, on human bodies. So with that, I will stop. Thank you, Andre, for a fascinating talk. I will clap on behalf of everybody. So uh, uh, I don't see any questions yet, but if uh, folks, if you have questions, please raise your hand and I will ask Andre your question. In the meantime, Andre, I will start with a simple question. So is there some kind of frequency dependence of, of the, you know, the different uh, properties that you're looking, the time series that we were looking at, the experimental time series, right? So if your exercise was, you know, like it was a different frequency at which things were happening, would you see any changes between the age three age groups? Did you look into that as well? Uh, I don't know. I would expect, so you're talking about, let's say yeah. the, let's say the duty cycle here or not, or oh, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. You do the exercise bouts will will definitely impact you know your ability uh, overall. You can you can imagine things are going to change smoothly, right? Uh, as you change the period, you know things will go up and down. But there might be some other things that kick in. You know, at some point, if you do this for too long, you're gonna. This is all aerobic, uh, but you know you have anaerobic uh, mm -hmm. met, uh, meta metabolism at some point kicking in, and then. Um, and we have a, a, a mathematical model, which I didn't get into at this point, that's, you know, that's trying to explain mm -hmm. what actually governs these changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and that model, I can just say a word about it uh, right here, is, uh, is basically that the data seem to be well fit by, uh, by a hypothesis where the rate of change of your entropy export rate, your dissipation rate, is proportional to your total entropy change. So if you actually make this hypothesis, this is going to actually fit the data pretty well. And uh, and in this context, things will just vary smoothly as a function of frequency. I so, uh, and I don't know, but I, I know... By talking with Glenn, that other things start happening if you do this too much, or if you exercise right. too much, and so on, right. and which which would not be captured by this simple model so far. Right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, folks? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly. I am. Uh, there is a small question from Om Prakash. So they are saying, uh, I if I want to measure an entropy of a gene where I have only information about the nucleotide number and their type, would it make sense to calculate entropy of a gene? So you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of entropic metrics of you know distribution you know as soon as you have a probability distribution you have uh the possibility of measuring the entropy of that distribution mm -hmm. if you have the sequence of uh of codons uh, or of amino acids uh, on a gene um i know people have, have looked at information theoretic approaches to that uh 
<clears throat> but that's kind of in a slightly different realm of um, looking at the dynamics of maybe some genetic regulatory system where you're generating entropy through the dynamics. So this ties in more to like dynamical entropies as you have in nonlinear dynamical systems, uh, which has to do with the predictability of the system over time. And I think we're, we're dealing more about predictability over time than this context here. But the but you no know, G there's genetic stuff going on all over the place be in the background here for sure. We're just not uh, analyzing it microscop microscopically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Even the questioner all says thank you. So thanks, Andre. Any further question? Jake Owens asked. Okay, he's just thanking both speakers. So what we will do is we will you know uh. Uh, stop recording and then take more questions for you, Andre, if there are more questions. Once again, Andre, thank